coming and, and welcome to a fourth conversation in a discussion series, Conversations with, with Business BVI. Firstly, please join me in welcoming Jerry, uh, Jerry Ferrara, QC. Um, we're very pleased to have Jerry, actually. Um, <laughs> reversing roles to the Jerry, um, from asking questions to answering questions. Um, and we, we'll tend to certainly pepper you as you at the end of the presentation. If you look at the progress that the BVI has made since the mid-50s, it becomes very clear and evident that the territory's economic progress has always closely been tied to its constitutional evolution. Whenever we've been given a structure that affords greater autonomy to look after more of our own affairs, we have seen considerable progress and prosperity in the territory. Um, if, if the BVI, which has been built an economy which has been built on the facilitation of global commerce and tourism is to thrive. We must be flexible, innovative, and bold. We must implement initiatives in every sphere that strengthen our brand and competitive posture globally. In this regard, constitutional advancement must also be viewed as one of the strategic opportunities to move this agenda progressively forward. I, I know that in most cases, constitutional change has never been looked at from that standpoint. Uh, the Brexit decision of the June 23rd made it very clear that we have entered what I'm calling a new normal as it relates to being an overseas territory. As we enter what is sure to be a sustained period of uncertainty as a territory, we must, be, we must reimagine our future and the critical strategic steps and decisions we must consider if we are to have a soft landing and not end up under the bus. One of, the few one of those strategic areas for consideration is constitutional evolution and how should that evolution be shaped to enhance our global competitiveness. Essentially, essentially, how should we be viewing the Constitution from an economic standpoint? In life, timing is always very critical. Our last constitutional review was in 2007, and from all indications, we are about to enter another such review. Jerry and I have been having this conversation over many years, actually, uh, what I'm calling a rolling con discussion about constitutional change and how should it be viewed as it relates to the territory's economic ag uh, agenda. Uh, Jerry is eminently qualified to lead us in this, this, today's discussion. He's a lawyer who's been practicing the territory for over 37 years. I may say one of our best legal minds. Uh, he's a senior partner uh, responsible for litigation at Ferrara Kerens. He actually chaired the 2003 Constitutional Review and served on the 2007 Constitutional Negotiating Team. More recently, he served as a High Court Judge for the, in the Commercial Court, giving him a unique vantage point to lead such a discussion. And needless to say, Jerry's a businessman. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Ferraro, QC, to make his presentation. Uh, good afternoon to one and all, and thank you very much, uh, Russell, for that uh, introduction. Um, as Russell has uh, said, we've been having uh, this sort of conversation for quite some time, and um, thank you. And uh, it is a matter in respect of which I have been Given, giving some thought over a period of years uh, as to not only the constitutional evolution of the British Virgin Islands, and the key question, of course, is where do we go from where we currently are and what are our options, but also why do we want to go in a certain direction once we've identified that direction? Once we've decided what direction we think we ought to go, um, how do we justify that? And on what basis do we justify that direction? And certainly the, the whole question of uh, economic development and sustaining or advancing the standard of living which we've come to enjoy in the territory is of, of critical importance to our future. And uh, the big question is not just simply the matter of the political decisions that must be made um, in government and in the House of Assembly, 
but from the point of view of the constitutional framework, how do we position ourselves to be better able to chart the course that we, the course that we need to chart and to be able to effectively do that and to sustain that type of, of, of process. Um, so uh, I take no responsibility for the actual wording of the topic. <laughs> it, it, it lies squarely within Russell's uh, purview, but uh, deepening the BVI's footprint as a global corporate domicile, a constitutional perspective. Um, Now, as has been mentioned, and as most of you would know, of course, I was the chairman of the constitutional review, a process that took some time, and eventually the report was uh, published in 2005. So I thought I would start with some excerpts from the historical section of the report in particular uh, to give you uh, a sort of uh, um, insight into some of the things that we, we looked at. And you'll see from the first uh, quotation, over the 25 years after the introduction of the ministerial system, our political leadership, while in the process of its own maturation, were able to demonstrate the effective use of power in lightening the, the darkness in areas of education, health, and generally to create an infrastructural base for giant strides in economic development of the territory. Of course, we can add there um, not just education and health, but you know, financial services, tourism, etc. Et and the Virgin Islands is a classic example of the use of power for the good of the people. So that was the, uh, uh, those uh, excerpts represent the collective thinking of the constitutional commissioners uh, of that time. Um, the other quotes, uh, they, the big question is how a micro-territory positions itself in a new global setting to continue to provide its people with enhanced quality of life and at the same time maintain a posture of dignity and cultural identity. It will not be possible to address this question until Virgin Islanders are prepared to deal with the boogeyman. And the boogeyman, in reference there, is independence. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a while. However, this objective of greater constitutional authority is being sought at the very time when British sovereignty in breadth and depth is being eroded by European integration and internationally by treaty obligations, some of which have been demonstrated to be against the best interests of the Virgin Islands. I thought that is a, was a very interesting statement made at the time in, in, in the report in 2005. Um, and what has, of course, happened very recently uh, in the Brexit uh, vote. Um, and it also underscores the question when we come to perhaps say something about independence, it, it underscores the, 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 the question and to some extent um, the point, one of the points that I wish to make, um, that regardless of who you are, whether you're an independent country and have had a long history of independence, regardless of how large you are, uh, both as an economy and as, uh, as a particular state. In today's global world, there is no such thing really as being, in essence, independent, totally independent, because you have to build relationships, whether in trade and other areas, and there's a measure of interdependency which ultimately can lead to some surrendering of sovereignty in order to make that workable, viable, and indeed beneficial to the advancement of the particular country. Um, the Commission is of the view that the new global reality requires creative relationships beyond that of the former official colonial mind 
which conceived of a linear process from colony to nation state. Novel relationships have to be explored that provide for the political aspirations of a people within a dignified setting other than being coerced into adopting a national status that is both unrealistic and unsustainable. And we can debate whether independence for the BVI is realistic, is it sustainable. Um, but you see that quotation emphasizes the whole question of carving out a new relationship, a new constitutional construct, um, which would take account of where the BVI has reached, where it would like to go, and the kind of world in which we must be and continue to be a player. The territory needs to be much more involved in its external affairs by sitting at the table and making its own representation, particularly in matters of financial services, regional and inter-Caribbean affairs we so recommend. Again, interesting uh, extract from the, from the report, particularly in light of some of the statements that have been made recently um, by our political leadership in uh, the post-Brexit vote, um, speaking to us as a country being at the table in the negotiations between the United Kingdom and the European Union as to what is going to be that new relationship um, as Britain prepares to exit the European Union. And uh, having that voice directly in order to ensure that whatever decisions are reached, whatever agreements are, are struck, take account of the interests of the British Virgin Islands. Um, I, I would just digress here slightly to, to, to sort of uh, uh, deal with one of my, my little beefs, so to speak, uh, with, with the whole Brexit vote. And, and it is this, and others have spoken to this, is that it is, isn't it strange, strikingly so, that as British citizens, none of us were afforded the right to vote on the Brexit issue except if you were in the United Kingdom at the time and you had that opportunity by being there. And Alex, my son, who is here, who is studying in England, fortuitously for him, he was there and, and got to vote. He hasn't told me which way he voted, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I, I'm not, not going to press him, uh, not, certainly not in, in this forum. But isn't that striking? I mean, you, you, we are for those of us who are full British citizens, with all the rights that go with that, in a modern world where you, the, the, in terms of the functioning of a democracy, one of the things that is of fundamental importance is finding the ways and means by which you can afford to your citizens, regardless of where they are in the world, the opportunity to partake in the democratic process and to exercise their vote, particularly on issues of very uh, great importance, such as, uh, as that particular vote. Um, if you thought that they were the constitutional commissioners, um, you know, they were perhaps leaning a little bit too much on, on the side of demonstrating that constitutional advancement is directly tied with economic um, advancement of the territory. Um, here is a quote from, from a, a well-known uh, history book. The history of the British Virgin Islands in the 20, 20th century has demonstrated the importance of legislative government in achieving progress. When the islands were more or less under external control before 1950, economic growth was negligible. Thereafter, the restoration of the legislature, enabling greater local participation in directing local affairs, has been followed by rapid, rapid economic expansion. As such, therefore, the strengthening of the political machinery by perm permitting more self-government seems imperative if greater prosperity 
and eventually complete self-sufficiency are to be achieved. So it's not only us as the constitutional commissioners who saw this from a historical perspective in, in this way. That brings us to the, what I call the seventh preamble in the 2007 Constitution, affirming that the people of the Virgin Islands have generally expressed their desire to become a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country at this stage of its development. And so that is one of those um, statements of who we are that appears in the Constitution. And in fact, um, that preamble um, was not in any prior Constitution. It's the first time that that was put in a Constitution of the, the Virgin Islands. Now, self-government, governance, what does this mean or entail in the 21st century global economy? And I've already touched on the whole question of strategic groupings, international trade agreements, uh, interdependency. Um, and uh, we go on to point out that there are many examples of these groupings, the European Union being one of them, CARICOM, closer to home, uh, being one, one of them, even the, um, um, the uh, Eastern Caribbean is, is another example. Each requires a degree of surrender of sovereignty and independence. Is independence for BVI really the best way forward? We come to a specific provision in the Constitution which deals with the governor's special responsibilities, section 60 of the Constitution. And I'm not going to bore you with the in, uh, provision in its entirety. Um, this is the part that I wanted to focus on, subsection 4. The governor shall by directions in writing, delegate to the premier or to any other minister designated by the governor on the advice of the premier, on the terms and conditions set out in subsection five, responsibility for the conduct of external affairs as they relate to any matters that fall under the portfolios of ministers, including. And so you first of all will observe the mandatory terms of that provision. The governor shall delegate and the, the process by which delegation is to take place is in writing. And this was one of the strategic things that was negotiated during the constitutional talks leading to the 2007 Constitution. That there are certain particular areas of governance which directly affect the prosperity and development of the country. And which, in, in many respects, historically, our political leadership have demonstrated their competence in dealing with those areas that ought really, from a practical point of view, and on a day-to-day -day basis, if I may put it that way, fall within the purview of our elected leaders, our government. And one of those areas which I have extracted, there are quite a number of them, including dealing with CARICOM and, and so on and so forth, regional stuff, is E. Uh, taxation and the regulation of finance and financial services. And F, European Union matters directly affecting the interests of the Virgin Islands. Couldn't be more relevant than in, to, in, in, in 2016 and what, what, what has happened here. So we see that this is a preset, this is a basis and principle that in a sense has been enshrined in our existing constitution in order to uh, enable our political directorate to do what is necessary, whether from a negotiating point of view or otherwise, in order to properly administer those, those, those particular portfolios that fall under ministerial responsibility, including uh, ministerial responsibility falling under the ambit of the premier. Now, of course, as you will expect, um, that uh, provision is subject, as it says already there, to certain conditions and limitations. Um, subsection 5, separate authority 
uh, from the Secretary of State to commence formal negotiations, conclude a treaty or international agreement. So in other words, um, if you want to commence formal negotiations, you can in a sense commence informal negotiations. And the question arises as to when informal uh, you know, moves into formal. When do you cross that uh, demar line of demarcation? And I, I remember this particular debate as I, I'm looking at the provision, and Lorna uh, may, may also remember this particular debate during the, the, uh, the negotiations in London as to you know, these particular provisions. Uh, B, not to sign any political declaration, understanding or arrangement in the field of foreign policy without approval. Of course, um, you can understand why that kind of limitation is there. No formal invitation to be issued to a head of state of another country to visit the BVI, it actually goes on to say without, without the approval of the governor. Um, and then the, um, this is uh, uh, of some importance. The cost of all the exercise of all this delegated authority uh, under Section 60, whatever it costs, is for us to bear as a country. Britain has no obligation to contribute uh, to this, although they have the ability as it were, to, uh, to make the decision as to whether we are going to move in a certain direction or not, and whether we're going to have these arrangements formalized in agreements or not. It goes on, the premier or other minister must keep the governor informed of, of such activities, and the premier or other minister shall provide the governor on request with a copy of all papers and information, including the text of any instrument on the negotiation. Again, not unexpected uh, limitations on, on that delegated authority. It goes further. Um, whatever is done by a premier or a, the, the minister who has been assigned the responsibility, having received the delegated authority, must be exercised in the best interest of the BVI. Well, of course. Um, we expect our elected representatives to do what is in the best interest of the country. Not to be prejudicial to the interests of Her Majesty, of course, that is not unusual uh, as a provision. Any disagreement uh, on the exercise of this authority, the Secretary of State is the final arbiter, and that is, that is binding. And the governor may give directions uh, on how to exercise such functions which must be followed. So the basic tenor of the Constitution is that the governor has these special responsibilities but in respect uh, of the responsibilities concerning external affairs, um, he shall delegate in, in accordance with that list of categories and areas. And that delegation is subject to certain limitations. But ultimately, the authority under the Constitution does not lie with the elected representatives. It lies with the governor as a representative of Her Majesty. Now, how in practice is this authority delegated? During the, uh, the constitutional negotiations, uh, particularly the final one in London, um, we negotiated what are called side letters. And many people may not have heard of these side letters. And uh, I, I, I would say the vast majority of, of persons in the country would not have even seen one of these uh, side letters. But this was the, the process that was agreed at the time uh, by which there would be uh, the de this delegation of responsibility in certain areas uh, in relation to ex external affairs. Um, in practice, the side letters have not been utilized. Prior to those negotiations, there were the a concept of what is called entrustments, and that indeed is the, the mechanism which has continued post the Constitution in terms of the delegation of, of this authority. So um, entrustments is, is, the, is the instrument that has been utilized, and some of these are quite wide in the areas that they cover. Uh, again, subject to certain conditions and limitations, and others are more area-specific. Um, I'm going to mention uh, 
two of them. There's a 2007 entrustment um, which expressly says that this is what is being done following the constitutional negotiations. And it is to commence formal negotiations and to conclude agreements in the specified areas. And it covers a wider range of areas and the responsibilities, which includes financial services, regulatory, supervision, and promotion. And also, it extends to the area of tourism. Um, as far as I'm aware, this entrustment is, is still in effect. Um, however, as these things go, they can be revoked at any time. Then we move to a more recent time the 2015 entrustment, which specifically focused on the People's Republic of China, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, and the Special Administrative Region of Macau. And that, it, it replaced uh, a similar entrustment, as it says in the document, uh, that had been entered to, into in 2014. And again, it's to commence formal negotiation, conclude agreements, and uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, entrustment. Um, now, in this uh, penultimate paragraph, I say, an important practical consideration relating to the effectiveness of entrustments is the interplay between the exercise of special authority by the governor in key areas and the approach adopted by a given premier uh, in the discharge of the functions which have been delegated. What really is the point I'm getting at here? Um, as you will appreciate, in, in any uh, governmental situation where, especially where you're talking about delegated authority or delegated power, um, the extent to which the person to whom the power has been delegated um, is given the full ambit to exercise that power within the confines of the delegation is directly related to how assertive the person delegating the authority is in trying to exercise what constitutionally is actually vested in them. So if you look at the entrustment and you look at section 60, which uh, in, it speaks in mandatory terms, you would think, well, yes, um, this is, is, is a great stride forward because it, it speaks in mandatory terms. The power must be delegated in those areas subject to the limitations. And, um, you know, there is full authority there for our elected representatives to go about doing what is necessary in those particular areas. But still, as I said before, the reservation of that power still vests in the governor. And some governors are more assertive than others. And so the question is, what is the dynamics at the given point in time, depending on which governor you have, or which person you have holding the office of governor, and indeed which person you have holding the office of, of, of premier? So, this is the situation in which we find ourselves as a country at this moment. We have certain powers that have been delegated to us, but ultimately those powers do not rest with our elected representatives. They rest with the governor. And a, a, a very assertive governor um, can effectively and from a practical perspective limit the extent to which the premier or a minister can really uh, function and exercise the delegated uh, power. Another factor, of course, is what, in my view, is what particular government is in power in the United Kingdom and what are their policies in relation to the overseas territories and in particular in relation to the Virgin Islands. I mean, just to, 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 uh, to, to buttress that point, we, we know that Jeremy Corbyn had made a statement saying that, in essence, if Labour had won the last general elections, direct rule would be reimposed on the Virgin Islands. 
So again, the policies, the thinking of the United Kingdom government is again of significance, great significance, in affecting the extent to which our elected representatives can exercise the delegated power. Um, dealing with the same entrustment, 2015, um, the areas covered financial services, trade investment, registration of ships, tourism, sport, culture, um, and opening the office in Hong Kong. So those of us who didn't uh, wondered how come we got an office in Hong Kong, um, we had an entrustment that enabled us to do that and to implement a decision which was made by the political directorate in the BVI for the betterment of the country. And that is really what we are talking about. Being able to make the kind of decisions that directly affect our economic development and prosperity and standard of living as a country going forward. Um, there are certain conditions. Uh, the Premier must provide a governor with an annual report. Of course, you can't sign any agreement without UK approval. Again, all the costs related to what you're doing must be borne by the BVI. And uh, the BVI must act in accordance with the protocols for effective financial management and the Public uh, Finance Management Act. Uh, two, two documents that are uh, of very great significance in how we conduct our, our financial affairs. Uh, important recent developments, um, this is not meant to be in any way exhaustive. Uh, we know at one point we won the French blacklist. We eventually were able to work our way off that, off that list. Um, the European Union blacklist, I'm told that um, that's pending. That's going to be coming out in a not too distant future. Will we be on it? Will we not be on it? Of course, we are all familiar, who isn't, uh, with the Panama Papers and what is the fallout for the BVI uh, in, in that sphere. That is still being analyzed and assessed. Brexit, of course, um, what will be the UK's new relationship with the EU? How would that affect the BVI? Is it an opportunity for the BVI or is it not? And views differ on this. And I think no one really knows at this point. We don't really have that answer because even Britain doesn't know. They are just beginning to put in place their own machinery for entering upon those negotiations. I don't, they haven't actually exercised, uh, what is it, Article 50 as yet. So we are very much in the early stages of the post-Brexit vote. And so none of us really can predict with certainty whether it presents the BVI with an opportunity or not. Hopefully it does, hopefully it does, uh, particularly in the area of financial services, but also particularly as it relates to the question of constitutional advancement, which I will come to uh, in, in a while. Um, of course, the new prime minister, uh, Theresa May, has said, look, Britain leaving the EU, but not Europe. So what does that mean? Again, that's still to be worked out. How important is the EU to the, the BVI economy? Um, there are those who are, uh, are better able to speak to that than I am. Um, and then the statement, BVI must be able to influence directly issues and decisions that affect the uh, directly or indirectly is economy and standard of living. Again, it comes back to the statement by Honorable Premier that we must be at the negotiating table on the issues that affect the BVI or will affect the BVI in terms of um, Britain's relationship with the EU going forward. Is China and Asia more important to the BVI economy uh, going forward than the European Union? Of course, I believe our approach has to be that these are all areas of importance to the BVI economy, and none of them should be excluded. They all must be, um, as it were, um, you know, we must maximize the benefits that we can de derive as a territory from all of these, uh, these uh, areas and, and regions. 
the case for constitutional review, um, the norm is, the, the, the sort of rule of thumb is 10-year uh, intervals. So we had a, uh, our last report was in 2005, the new constitution is 2007. And uh, we've heard uh, recently, as I mentioned below, uh, the, both the premier and the leader of the opposition has been, have called for constitutional review. Um, in principle, they agree on that. Uh, the extent to which they may agree on the particular areas for advancement and review, that is something left uh, to be seen and to be, to be, to be uh, revealed. Um, however, not every review of the 10-year interval is a total review of the Constitution. In the past, we've had some reviews that have focused on specific areas, including, as I mentioned there, uh, belongers status. What should be our approach uh, to constitutional advancement? Are we limited to minor changes and adjustment with no significant devolution of constitutional responsibility? Are we to be limited strictly to the Westminster model constitution? What are our options? Associated statehood is a thing of the past. Um, some of you may not even remember it. Um, a lot of the, the, the uh, countries in the, in, the, in the West Indies that are now independent countries um, at one time were associated states. Um, and we've had uh, the abolition of that uh, by the United Kingdom many years ago. So that is not something that's on the cards. Um, is independence or the current overseas territory status our only options? Um, the UK's position, as has been communicated in different ways, is that, well, look, we think that you have basically gotten as far as you're going to get. We may be able to tweak something here, tweak something there. In fact, recently um, we had the addition of um, junior ministers, uh, and two of them were, were appointed. That actually is not something completely novel because it is provided for in the Bermuda Constitution and has been there uh, for some time. Um, so yes, that was something that uh, we were able uh, to, to achieve. Um, Independence, um, well, one of the things that the UK government has had made clear in the past, and I believe that continues to be uh, the position, is that you will have to hold a referendum <laughs> for that to happen, uh, to get the right vote. Uh, you know, I, I chuckle because of the referendum in England. I've never seen something that was done so badly in my life. I mean, it's, it's, it's nonsense. I mean, you do not... You're in a you're in a a a, a, um, a grouping for I believe it was 43 years, and you went for a majority vote as to whether you should remain or get out. That should have been at least a special majority vote. But the point I'm really getting at is that governments are historically reluctant to hold referendums because inevitably. It turns into a referendum on the government's performance and not so much on the issue on which people are called upon to exercise their vote. And so that, that is something which um, you know, is just a simple reality and that we can see it manifested itself in, uh, to a large extent in the United Kingdom on the Brexit vote where people were saying in the aftermath um, that, well, look, you know, we didn't really know what we were voting for. Or, you know, we exercise our vote because we didn't like something that was, was, was or was not happening in our particular area, and we weren't really voting on the issue we were called upon to vote. Uh, I would just pause to recognize the, the presence of our, of our premier who has, who has just arrived. Um, is there any real support in the BVI for independence? Well, only a referendum really can tell us that. I mean, successive constitutional reviews have devoted, including the one that I chaired, have devoted no more than a line, a sentence rather, or two in the report to in the independence. And it basically says, at this time, there is real, no real support for independence. And you move on to the next issue in the report. 
Um, can we sustain independence both economically and, and, and practically? And what then is the way forward for the BVI? And what really is independence in, in the, the modern 21st century context when the global economy mandates that you must forge relationships and groupings um, for the, uh, in order to, to compete effectively on the world market. And that in of itself often re requires a surrender of some degree of sovereignty. I mean, in, in the context of the United Kingdom and the, uh, and the EU, um, one of the points that was made very forcefully is that the laws of the EU are so interwoven into the fabric of the British legal system. How are you going to unravel those in the post-Brexit uh, era. And that, that just tells you the extent to which there has been you know, a surrender of some degree of so sovereignty. And uh, it, it also speaks to the challenge that Britain will have going forward in terms of the kind of relationship it carves out with the European countries. Right, now, this, I come now to the question of size. And, and this is, in, in a sense, getting me to, to my basic uh, thesis uh, for today. Um, because, you know, there's an expression, size matters. And, you know, in, uh, normally that's in the context of being big. You know, when, when, a, when a big truck is coming down the road, you get out of the way when you're driving your little small car. Size matters. But I am saying the reverse here. I'm saying size matters, yes. But it matters that we are basically a small country um, with small populations, small landmass. Um, we have been able to, um, to play a role, Russell puts it this way, uh, punching above our weight in the world, um, uh, the global finance um, uh, area as, as, as a territory. I think we had some figures years ago as to what the BVI contributes to the economy in China and so on and so forth, right? And, and so, you know, it, it, to me, um, the size of the territory is actually an advantage, and it's an advantage in many areas, including the area of governance, and us developing and crafting a particular type of constitution that provides for or provides the springboard for our future economic success. And the fact that we are a small territory um, actually is something which assists us in becoming that kind of model, both from the point of view of the constitution itself, the constitutional construct, and also in terms of our democratic institutions and the way in which we conduct our governance. And that is, is something that I, I personally uh, feel very strongly about. Now, we have, of course, the other advantages which all of us are familiar with, the natural beauty, where we are geographically. Uh, cons we have constitutional governance. We have the rule of law, the English common law. We've had stable governments. We've had uh, democratically held elections. We've had smooth transitions of power. Um, that is part of our, our historical profile. Um, of course, we have the two pillars of the economy, um, which um, to a large extent, um, while, to, while to some extent it depends on what we do here, and, uh, uh, and this comes back to the, the point that we're gonna be discussing, but there are external factors that can significantly affect those two areas of our economy. And to me, that also speaks loudly to the question of whether we should not be directly involved in ensuring that the things that could adversely affect those two particular areas of the economy um, are, are matters that we can you know, um, have some say in and ensure that 
we are able to carve out the best relationship, the best uh, deal, so, so to speak. Um, modern framework of laws and, and, and regulations relating to financial services. This is a point which has been made in the, uh, particularly in the post-Panama uh, Papers um, uh, uh, debacle. And to me, this is a, a point that we need to make from a marketing point of view consistently. We must not just simply, in a sense, be re reacting to something negative. We must continue to educate, both locally and by going out into the outside world, utilize the avenues that are available to us to demonstrate what we do, how we do it, and the role we play in the global economy and why what we do is something that should be preserved and should be protected and should be advanced. Um, internationally respected commercial court, and we essentially still have a good reputation, in my view, internationally, even in the aftermath of the Panama Papers. Now, constitutional advancement short of independence. Um, a new and modern constitutional construct and relationship with the United Kingdom needs to be forged. And of course I mentioned this is of particular importance and I think this is an opportunity that has presented itself in the post-Brexit uh, vote. Um, we need to look at the Westminster model constitution. Is this something that um, is best suited for governance in small territories? and the extent to which that constitutional framework and model should be revised, should be changed, in order uh, to facilitate better governance in a small territory. Um, the new constitution must deepen democratic principles and institutions, and the extent of involvement of our elected representatives in negotiating directly with governments and organizations on issues and affairs that do or will impact the BVI economy and standard of living. It's essentially a point that I have tried to make uh, uh, already. In short, the BVI must be facilitated and empowered to chart and secure its own destiny, development, and prosperity. And let me pause here and say this. We all live in a wonderful place called the British Virgin Islands or the Virgin Islands. And it, we have the beauty we have the, th the strides that we've made from an economic point of view. We have the, the benefits that have accrued to the territory and to us as individuals. Um, whether we are from the BVI or if we are from elsewhere, by being able to live and operate and conduct our business in the economy that has been um, forged for the BVI, particularly in the areas of financial services and tourism. Each of us individually have a personal stake in the preservation of our standard of living. And this is something that we must take very seriously. Each of us have a personal stake in the preservation of our standard of living. Because that is something which we have worked hard collectively to develop, and that is something which is worthwhile preserving. And in order to preserve that, you must be able constitutionally to do the things that are necessary in order to ensure its preservation and its sustainable sustainability going forward for generations to come. So it is not just simply some esoterical principle. It is not simply some legal construct or principle that we are concerned with. It comes down to the personal level that we must protect what we have come to cherish and enjoy. And each of us have a direct stake and interest in that preservation. Um, facilitation includes more meaningful representation and participation in government, in governance, decision making, greater transparency and accountability, better checks and balances, and better use of scarce human resources in both the public and private sector. Now that last point there, I just say something a little bit more expansive about that. Um, because um, I, I gave a, um, a, 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 a talk to the public service, I think it was um, the, the public service awards, the first um, um, of, of that type of awards, 
in which I looked at the public and private sector and their respective roles. And uh, you, some of you may have seen uh, that, that uh, address replicated in BVI Business, uh, where I talked about um, a bimetal strip, what is our coefficient of linear expansion, um, very much physics principles. I thought I would demonstrate that I have some versatility outside just simply talking. You know, <laughs> but I, I, I was hopefully careful not to trespass too far into the aspect of physics that I have no idea about. Uh, but the thesis of that, the basis of that, is that in a, coming back to the smallness of the society, where we have scarce human resources, and we have, we have human resources that have expertise in particular areas, both in the public sector and in the private sector, and we should have a greater utilization of those expertise and human resources for the betterment of the country. Because it comes back to the principle and the point I made just a while ago, we each have a personal stake in the standard of living of the territory. And so to me, and this comes back to the whole question of constitutional construct and what new model constitution we ought to have, is that we must look at the public and the private sector differently from how we traditionally have looked at it based on the Westminster model and based on what essentially we have been given by the United Kingdom. And because to me, again, as a small territory with those scarce resources, those are the things that we need to look at and uh, uh, being able to say that the Westminster model, there are changes that need to be made that would better suit governance and development in a small territory like the BVI and would position us and reposition us to better and more effectively be able to chart our development, our economic development and our prosperity going forward. Now, I can't of course in giving um, this sort of presentation confine myself purely to, well, what should we have in relation to financial services? So I'm going to throw out some things in terms of constitutional advancement, which um, are just ideas at this stage coming from me. They are not necessarily things that I have come to a final position on. But I think these are some of the things that we need to be looking at generally. In relation to the legislative branch, election uh, to the House of Assembly. Now, is the mixed system, territorial and district, serving us well? Um, should it be changed? And if so, to what type of system or model um, if we feel that it is not serving us well? So I think this is something that we need to look at. If you recall, um, it must have been at least 15, perhaps more years ago, um, there was a one-man commission that looked in to the question of the mixed system and the recommendation was for a mixed system and we've since had that mixed system. Is that serving us well? Should that be retained as part of a new model constitution? I think that is something that we need to consider. Uh, reform and modernization of the rules and procedures of the House to foster increased efficiency, meaningful debate, public input before the passage of pieces of legislation. Again, when we did the constitutional review, at the time, the thinking was the next major review was going to be in relation to the House of Assembly, its procedures, etc., etc., etc. And I think that is something which recently has been looked at in a piecemeal, a piecemeal fashion, but we need to take a more holistic and comprehensive look at that. Greater openness and transparency in the workings of the House of Assembly. To me, it is not just simply enough that, well, the, the proceedings of the House are uh, televised or on radio. Yes, that is important, but there are other ways that we can, in fact, increase uh, openness and transparency as to how the House functions, and, 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 and that leads to greater accountability. Reform and restructuring of standing committees and how they function. We still have the same standing committees that we've had going back uh, many, many decades and you know, previous constitutions. 
And I think we need to look again at our standing committees, how they function, um, how we can improve effective oversight and transparency, and of course, accountability in government. And then giving teeth to the findings and recommendations of certain watchdog committees to facilitate effective checks on government and overspending and matter administration. In other words, this is all speaking to the kind of model that we should develop, but the kind of practices that we sh and rules and regulations that we should have in place that facilitates good governance and demonstrates that we are, as a territory, as small as we are, a shining example of what governance of a small territory ought to be. Um, Re-examine the role of the opposition, including the leader of the opposition. I threw that in, um, and I'm sometimes asking myself, well, what do you really mean by that, <laughs> Jared? And I, I, I can't say that I have fully worked it out. But I think if you're looking at the government side of things, you have to look at the other side as well, uh, in a, taking a pragmatic approach and a more holistic approach to, to uh, constitutional uh, review. Um, reform and strengthening of the budget appropriation bill process. Effectively. Now, I mean, I, um, I think this is a key area. I mean, the budget is perhaps the most important piece of legislation that is considered by the House of Assembly. And we ought to be looking at that process. Is it, is it um, serving us as well as it should? Um, and we know it takes a considerable amount of time. A considerable amount of time because you're not, you, you have the, 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 uh, the, the committee meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have the our ministers of government, including the premier, who are, who are tied up for many, many hours in these sessions, etc., etc., etc. Is that process serving us well? A code of ethics for members of the House of Assembly and ministers of government. Um, this might be a bit of a controversial issue, but I think in a modern 21st century BVI, and hopefully with a new constitutional construct, um, we cannot ignore ethics, how our elected representatives are to conduct themselves, particularly in, in, in the House. And that is something I believe that is of great importance because it, it, it speaks to the kind of democracy we have. It speaks to how we have matured in the management of our affairs and the conduct of our affairs as a country. Um, privileges of, of, of members, um, limitations in a modern society. This is a topical issue, as you will recall from previous meetings of the House, um, and you know, accusations and counter-accusations in relation to abuse of of the privileges of the House as it, as it relates to, to, to members. And I believe this is something that needs to, to be looked at. In fact, one member of the House pointed to legislation in Antigua, uh, which had been recently uh, put in place, that actually m limited the, the extent of the privilege which members um, were afforded in, when uh, speaking in the, the House of Assembly. And these are things in a modern society, in a modern world, that we need to be, to be looking at. Um, reporting function of ministers of the House of Assembly, mandatory obligation. Um, we have reporting. Um, I believe it, and I could be wrong about this, and I, I stand to be corrected, but I believe that is done as a matter of government decision making that on a fairly regular basis, Ministers will be reporting in the House in relation to particular aspects of government decision making and uh, uh, advancement and so on and so forth. That to me should be mandatory uh, if it is not already. Um, and uh, that is something I believe that we need to look at because again leads to more openness, transparency, transparency and accountability in government. Um, Question and answer, uh, re-examine the process, etc. I'm not going to say too much about, about this, but I do believe there's, there's, there's room for improvement, uh, significant improvement in that particular area. Um, now, I go to the executive uh, branch, cabinet. 
should the governor continue to sit presiding cabinet. In Bermuda, the governor does not sit or presiding cabinet. The premier is the one who presides in cabinet. And you know, there are the, the provisions in the Bermuda Constitution that provide for that. Now, I, I just simply ask a question here. I mean, we know that Bermuda has seen a certain level of development over a certain period of time, but then so has the BVI. Have we not reached the stage in our development, like Bermuda, where our elected leader, the premier, should be the one presiding in cabinet? What the current constitution does is that it provides that the premier and the governor will ultimately decide on the agenda for cabinet and so on and so forth. But I believe in practice, um, in practice, the governor still, as it were, presides over cabinet meetings. Um, the one thing we've been able to achieve uh, for some years is moving cabinet meetings from the governor's office to the premier's office. So at least symbolically, we have made a change, but we need to go, I believe, further than that. I think we've had the kind of maturing and maturity that we can do that. It doesn't mean that there are not going to be certain reporting obligations and certain other checks and balances. You would expect that that would be there short of, you, of, of BVI being an independent country. Enhanced role and powers of the premier. Well, that sort of goes hand in hand with what I'm saying about uh, the premier presiding in cabinet. Um, number of ministers re-examine the role and function of junior ministers. I throw that in. Um, because that's always something that is looked at. Um, you know, do we have the right number of ministers? It was felt that our ministers are uh, overworked. The Constitution provides for one other minister, but there's a process constitutionally by which that could be put in place. But the decision was taken to have junior ministers, similar to what's in the Bermuda Constitution, and that now has, has been achieved. But I, I, I think, to me, it is not just enough to make that kind of a change. We need to have the constitutional framework under which that process will function and hopefully be effective. And the Constitution doesn't really speak to that. And perhaps that is something that it, it needs to speak to. The vesting of authority and responsibility in ministers for their respective portfolios. At the moment, the, 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 the terminology in the current constitution is responsibility for the administration of any department. And it's a similar um, phraseology that's used in the Bermuda constitution. There has been some debate about this. What does this really mean? Because you have to juxtaposition the legal reality that the public service is not under the purview of ministers. So when you say a minister is responsible for the administration of any department, what is the extent of that authority, particularly as it relates to the public servants who fall within that particular department or within his, his portfolio? And I think that is something that we need to look at more closely and perhaps develop it more in a new constitution. Um, specific devolution of executive authority for external affairs I say except defense, I don't think we have any battleships, uh, and the administration of courts. Courts really, uh, to a large extent, is never put under political uh, direction. Um, so you, you divorce that from the political directory. Uh, so we are saying everything else should go to the premier and responsible ministers with appropriate reporting obligations and general oversight. And then specifically now in relation to financial services, a complete devolution of executive authority in the areas of financial services and tourism to the premier and responsible ministers, subject again to limited constraints and reporting obligation. So in other words, it is not just simply enough to have a delegated power in section 60 of the constitution. Those things that are covered by entrustments and so on, the constitution should start from the premise and from the position that those are the responsibility of elected um, officials, subject to the limitations, subject to the reporting and oversight uh, obligations. I throw in also the public service, which I, I, I just mentioned, the police force, 
I think some member of the House recently said that there will come a day when the police force falls under the Premier. So I throw that in, in there. Accountability, appointments, discipline. And we have, of course, the, um, the National Security Council, which was ushered in with the 2007 Constitution. And it's, it would be interesting to, to, to find out how that functions and whether it functions with it, it functions in the way in which it was thought that it ought to function when it was put in the Constitution. Um, I don't have any particular uh, um, uh, factual evidence on that, so I can't speak to it directly because I've never been to a National Security Council meeting. But certainly it is a step in that direction because the, the, the basic principle here is that economic development, which we are saying should be within the purview of our elected representatives, is directly related to security. If, if you, 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 can, you can negotiate the best agreements and, and, and provide the best platforms, for, platforms for, for economic development and advancement, but the one thing that can completely undermine all of that is a country where security is not what it ought to be. And so there's a direct connection and correlation, and we have to recognize that. And that is why we, we, we agreed upon the National Security Council, where there would be a bringing together of the governor and the premier and one other minister of, of government, and I believe the attorney general. And it's not going to be simply a reporting function on Monday morning of what transpired over the last week and the weekend. How many persons were robbed, how many were, may have been shot, or whatever it is. I mean, that is just the symptoms of, of the, the whole question of security, but the decision making that should affect security within the country must be a collective responsibility. And the question, therefore, remains for constitutional advancement, should that be something that falls within the purview of the elected representatives? Because also, ultimately, the, f the, 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 the budgetary aspect of this question falls within the purview of our elected representatives. So it's our money that is being spent on internal security. But at the same time, on the previous constitutions, it was not something in which our elected representatives constitutionally had any say. Um, city councils. This is something that has been floated around a bit. Um, because when we speak of constitutional advancement, we must speak to the deepening of democratic institutions and the strengthening of democratic institutions within a country. And a representative government and participatory government. And it seems to me that this is one area that we can look at quite seriously, city councils. I, I know that there is some, there is some natural disinclination, um, just like there's a, a natural disinclination for the governor to cede um, authority special uh, uh, responsibilities to elected representatives, there's also a natural disinclination for elected representatives to cede some of their authority to th individuals who will be making up like a city council, for example, to, to, um, to run an organized road town. But I think this is an area that we need to look at very seriously because this also provides an avenue, a direct avenue through which the taxpayers, the people, can have an effective say in how areas of the country are developed and run. I put there, of course, it, trying to be as, um, as fair uh, across the board as I can. Not just Road Town, but East End Long Look. It's a huge community in East End Long Look. Um, West End. Virgin Gorda, Anigada, Joss Van Dyke. As you know, Joss Van Dyke has been, uh, over the years, making um, uh, uh, 
rumblings and so on and, and noise about say, they're saying that we don't think we are getting our fair share and we are not being looked after in the way in which we think we should, should be looked after and so on. And it may very well be that through the auspices or through the me mechanism of a city council, um, people on Just Van Dyke can have a more direct say with budgetary allocations in relation to each of the city councils with accountability, transparency, reporting functions, not just to cabinet, but also to the House of Assembly as to how those monies have been spent. All right, um, time, yes, and um, uh, Lorna, when I spoke with her, she said, don't be as long. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I'm getting close to the end. Areas of growth for our, our BVI financial services industry. Growth prospects in the BVI and Asia Pacific region, Singapore, Africa, Latin America, Brazil, um, leverages good reputation. Um, expand, expanded use, this can lead to an expanded use of uh, uh, Asia House. Um, all of this really I'm taking from um, Francis Wu's conversation, which was last week, which unfortunately I wasn't able to attend, but I've had the benefit of taking a look at. So she, I think, really has addressed this. And for those of you who attended, you would have heard it. For those of you who did not I, and, and you haven't yet read her presentation, I would suggest that you do. So I'm not going to make the case again for the importance of Asia, you know, China, uh, Singapore, even Japan, of course, India, um, Africa, and Latin America. We are all well aware of, of this. And this is an interesting one about private wealth growth in Asia and the Pacific reaching 224 trillion in, by 2020. Um, a new constitution must empower BVI to effectively chart its own course and compete in the global arena, which is the point I've been trying to make all along in, in this uh, presentation, development of uh, new areas of business, defending the financial services industry. It is ours. We must be the ones with the constitutional responsibility and ability to defend it. Um, empowered, to be empowered constitutionally to negotiate directly rather than through intermediaries or with the sanction of the UK government, with countries government. This has distinct advantages for BVI. If you look at it in its simplest terms, if I have something that is at stake, now, unless I, am, I feel that I am not qualified to advocate for myself and to defend myself, so I have to hire Russell, who is better equipped and better qualified to do that. Unless that is the case, then I am the one who should be there at the table directly negotiating and making the kind of decisions that I think is in my best interest. And so I try to put it in, in, in very simplistic terms uh, in, in that way. Um, no one can protect BVI, interests like BVI. Um, deepen BVI's ability to do what is necessary in its interest to secure its uh, future economic uh, development. Financial services must become the constitutional purview and full responsibility of BVI government. And BVI must become the model for small state governance in a 21st century global economy. And this, to my view, requires a new model constitution, not just simply, as I say down below, looking at the Bermuda Constitution and saying, well, they have this, and we should get the same thing. To me, that is a, a too limited and too narrow an, an approach. We must be looking at this in a much broader perspective, what model, what construct better enables us to govern our country effectively and to make the kind of decisions that will affect economic growth and prosperity. Um, and so what is the way forward? Comprehensive reform, modernization of the public service, etc., etc. the McKinsey Report. I'm not going to say much about that. A lot has been said about that. In other words, that is a step in the direction of us becoming, I believe, what we ought to be, at least in how 
we look to investment and I, and, and I say both local and foreign investment how investor friendly are we uh, strengthen uh, our ex existing regime of laws adopt best practices of course that's there public education and input are major concern we have to be able to and and this is all part of the McKinsey uh, for the 10 major areas but we have to be able to bring our people along and that really is not just simply about telling them what financial services is about that's important but it is about providing broadly in a broad terms a kind of education to enable and empower our own people so that they can do what they want to do um, as entrepreneurs or whatever it is they choose to do in terms of the BBI economy. So it, 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 it has to be looked at. But this is very, very important, public education. The public must understand where we are taking the country. And that ties right into a point that I have been um, um, belaboring periodically for maybe the last 15 years. Long-term strategic planning for economic, social, and infrastructural development. I think the public needs to be involved in that. And we need to have a vision, and we need to know where we are taking the country in 15 years. And that is something that must be worked on and must have public input and input from all of the stakeholders, including you good persons who are here today. Secure, of course, uh, UK's agreement for constitutional review. Well, we leave that to the Premier. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be able to achieve that. Uh, fight for direct representation in the Brexit negotiation. We've touched on that. Propose a new model constitution. And you might ask me, well, what is this new model? Well, it has to be something that we all think about carefully. And I've touched on certain things that I think need to be looked at. But how that model is framed in my own mind, still has to be worked out. Um, justify the new model on sound legal and economic basis. You're not going to get it if you can't justify having it. It's not simply enough to say, well, we need it. You have to be able to justify it. You have to argue from a position of knowledge and a position that is going to be convincing because progress is not given to you. You have to go after it. You have to take it. Um, be bold and innovative in proposing the new model. Be courageous, realistic, pragmatic, pragmatic, and flexible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.